Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the program. Today we're going to discuss a new genetic study that reveals the genetic makeup of people from North Asia during the time of the Bering Migration, as well as new gene flow headed back in the opposite direction from North America. So you see this genetic backflow. So the study uh, centers around the genomes of 10 individuals at around 7,500 years before present. So about 5,000 BC, 5,500 BC. And they're from three regions in North Asia, which is the Altai Sayan, the Russian Far East, and the Kam Kamchatka Peninsula, which you guys can see here on the map. So the map on top is uh, sam the sampling locations of the newly reported individuals and the, their related ancient genetic groups. So you can see represented by Kennewick Man here and then um, Ansic One. And you can see uh, a similar marker right here in Beringia. And then if you look to the west, you have the aforementioned uh, regions, the Altai Cyan region, and then the Kamchatka Peninsula here, represented by these two uh, uh, blue, blue circles. And then you have just the general Russian Far East area. And then directly east of that is Sakhalin Island and Japan to the south. And all of these areas have uh, similar similarities in both their haplogroups and and the specific genetic markers belonging to a group called the ANE or the Ancient North Eurasians, which we'll uh, discuss at, at length in a, in a bit here. Figure B here, it's a principal component analysis. Ancient in individuals are shown in symbols with filled colors. This panel reports ancient individuals projected onto the PC space calculator with modern day Eurasian individuals shown in gray dots. Uh, I have the link to this. Uh, if you guys want to see it in its entirety and read the entire um, study, of course, I have it in, in the description. One of the biggest uh, surprises that they found, uh, one of the bigger discoveries from this study as a result of the study is that it reveals a previously undescribed group of early Holocene Siberians from the Altai Cyan region, uh, which is the, basically, if you want to remember, it's the crossroads of Russia, China, Mongolia, and Kazakhstan, like right around where Lake Baikal is, a little bit west of Lake Baikal. Uh, these were the descendants of both Paleo-Siberian and ancient North Eurasian people described as a mixture of two groups that lived in Siberia during the Ice Age. Again, this is the previously undescribed group. This group also contributed to many contemporaneous and subsequent populations across North Asia. So this is huge. Um, they had no idea this group existed, mainly because they had no idea he existed until they discovered the Siberian boy who died 20,000 years ago, which uh, is referred to as the Malta boy or MA1. Once they found the Siberian boy, they cross-examined it as a distinct uh, and discovered that it was a distinct marker in prehistoric Asia through other ancient genomes. Uh, one thing that they found about the, this ancient North Eurasian component or marker, it's characterized by a high degree of genetic diversity, which is the result of a mixture of different groups, including the ancient Paleo-Siberians, which we're going to dis uh, discuss uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, the ANE component is found in lower levels in populations from other regions in Europe and Asia, such as the British, the French, the Han Chinese, and the Tibetans. So these people were very successful in terms of uh, spreading their, their genetics and leaving a lasting imprint. So, of course, this suggests that they played an important role in shaping the genetic makeup. They, con they contributed to the genetic ancestry of many, many present-day populations which are, again, associated with the combination of the haplogroups N1C1, R1A, and R1B. And these are common in populations, again, all over Central Asia. So it's led to a lot of geneticists to agree that the ANE component is likely the result of gene flow from different populations. And now we know that it, it's going to, from North America as well. There's gene flow coming in into the region from the east in relation to the Bering Strait, the east, which would be Alaska and North America. So the aforementioned Paleo-Siberians refers to the ancient human populations that inhabited the region of Siberia before the arrival of present-day indigenous populations. So again, these are uh, this is an ancient population that, again, they have, they, they, were, they, have, uh, they were one of the main contributors to the, the ancient North Eurasians. And another thing to note is that the Altai region is where the Denisovans were found. So 
you know, that th this area has been occupied by one human or another for a long, continuously for a very long time. So, you know, that adds to the complexity of the whole uh, situation here. Um, the unique gene pool may re represent an optimal source for the inferred any related population that contributed to the Bronze Age groups from North and Asia, Inner Asia, which is again, uh, Lake Baikal, Tarim Basin, Okunevo, Pastoralis, all these groups are becoming threaded together by this one big group. They seem to play a huge role in when you trace back the ancestry of the of the local populations and discoveries such as MA1, the 20,000 year old boy, and you trace those genetic links all the way back. It seems that these um, ancient North Eurasian people played a huge role and had their genetics involved with many different people across many different geographies. So in, an, in one of the other individuals, they uncovered ancient Northeast Asian ancestry uh, through the Neolithic hunter-gatherers from the Russian Far East. And spread of this ancestry is 1,500 kilometers farther west than previously thought. And then they also identified a 7,000-year-old individual with Jomon rela related ancestry, which is a hunter-gatherer group from the Japanese ar archipelago. So, And it makes sense, right? When you look at the map, you can see that there's these chain of islands that connect to the peninsula. And then there's also Sakhalin to, to the north, which connects to uh, uh, the Russian Far East. So the data is consistent with multiple phases of gene flow from North America to Northeast Asia over the last 5,000 plus years. And then they've, they went further west to the Kamchatka Peninsula and then Central Siberia as well. And then these hi these findings highlight the interconnected population throughout the north throughout North Asia from the early Hol Holocene onwards. All these people were threaded together. It's definite now. It's definite. It's not a theory. So they were they always wanted to hit home the fact that people weren't just stationary. They were moving around constantly in a very short amount of time. So uh, this discovery r helps lend credence to that. To people who aren't who aren't already on board or are very cautious, it can kind of get them to agree that okay, we we aren't dealing with a, a, a living glacier here. We're talking about people with needs and desires and, and like like people who were driven by not just climate but a bunch of other factors. I mean, the lead author was surprised because um, the individual dated to a similar period as other Altai hunter-gatherers had completely different genetic profile with connections to populations in the Russian Far East and, and, and other areas close there. This individual that uh, the author is talking about was found in a cave with rich burial goods. They had religious costume, objects, which, you know, implies all sorts of stuff like... Uh, People of different profiles and backgrounds were living in the same region at the same time. He could have come from far away or he could have lived close by. They're, they're not sure. But his grave goods are different than the other archaeological contexts. So this implies mobility both culturally and genetically in the Altai region. The, uh, of course, the dust isn't settled or anything like this. But a finding like this really helps elucidate a lot of things. So we can kind of get a higher resolution here, what was going on genetically anyway. Uh, the ge genetic data from the Altai show that the North Asia harbored highly connected groups as early as 10,000 years ago across long geographic distances, which again suggests that human migrations and admixtures were the norm and not the exception, even for hunter-gatherer societies. I mean, let's just start, let's just take the, the MA1, the, the 20,000-year-old uh, boy. Let's just take him for... Uh, let's just take that timeline from 20,000 years to, to about 7,500 years uh, before present. What could have driven these people to move? What the academics seem to think is uh, climate change events, w such as the last glacial maximum, you know, led to reduction in temperatures, expansion of glaciers. Of course, this is a factor in driving population movements. Um, the Younger Dryas is another one, um, if you want to get closer to, to that date to the date in question rather when you want to look at uh, the geographic region of the peninsula the Kamchatka peninsula it, it's a region known for its volcanic activity there's a big volcano there and that can cause disruptions in local ecosystems that can affect survival of human populations living there which can lead to movement and, and gene flow as well 
So all of these factors, um, including ones that we don't even know about, could could um, lead to all this movement. Now, it, it seems like common sense, me saying this, but in terms of academia, you this was very highly um, renegade or 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 uh, baseless to suggest that people were leaving North America. It was ingrained that not only was Clovis first, but they came in at this time and only in this direction. And at the time that they said that it made sense to them in term because of what was the lack of evidence. But I mean, <laughs> so much time has passed that there's been so many discoveries that it's time to update it. This is a, a great leap forward in doing that. So anyway, let me know what you guys think about this episode. I thought it was very fascinating. What are some of the implications of these people uh, passing in and out of the of Beringia? And how does it relate to thing to the bigger picture like the multi-regional hypothesis right um which i mean a, a very when you break it down a very similar um argument is being made that a developed people are moving from one area to another i think this is a, a microcosm of that type of uh argument of that of that type of the multi-regional argument in motion or not even the entirety of the multi-regional argument just parts of it you know just the part where people are <laughs> the idea that people could have developed in one area for a certain amount of time and then come back from where they came from that's again that sounds like common sense or that doesn't sound too arbitrary but in academia that is uh it'll be laughed out of the room unless you have piles and piles of evidence which you know is there so anyway uh, let me know what you guys think and i'll talk to you later